Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Yep, this is a super mini mail call episode again, and let's get right to it. I have a package here. Uh, let's see, this one comes from, well, I can't tell what the name is, but it's from someone in Tucson, Arizona. Package has been here since last year. So yeah, I have some more packages down on the floor next to me here that are all also from last year. So I'm trying to kind of get through those. Maybe we will in this video, maybe we won't. This one here is pretty big, so might be a lot of stuff in here, which, you know, I like to go through everything little by little. So, okay, let me grab a knife and let's open this up. Regarding last week's mail call episode, I just want to thank everyone who sent in emails and put comments and stuff on uh, the various things that I'd opened. The TIAC video data recorder thing, it's not a video recorder, it just uses videotapes. We never actually uh, got to a manual on there, although I think a viewer emailed me and said that they had a manual for it or another unit that was very similar. In this box though, we have a note. This package comes from Andrew and he says, these discs have been in the climate controlled environment for a very long time. If any eight inch discs from the 70s or 80s are going to work, these are them. I believe they were used on a TRS-80 Model 2, so I'm hoping you can read and use these discs. As per usual, if you can't use them, please pass them on. Best wishes, Andrew, Tucson, Arizona. Hi to all my Arizona viewers. Let's see what's in here. I'll just unpack everything. I think Andrew has gone ahead and sent the mother load of floppy disks. And the fact, if they, the fact that they were in a climate controlled environment is extra great because uh, discs do not appreciate when they are stored in uh, extra hot or extra uh, humid environments. They get moldy, they get damaged and all that. It looks like this was packaged up when election season was happening in the US, which is in November, because there's some election mailers and stuff, plus a lot of crumpled up newspaper, which I really, really appreciate it because it can all go in the recycle bin. Okay, I think that is everything. So let's take a look what we have here look at all these discs this is awesome there's so many okay so first thing is uh oh <laughs> that's funny i think this is just packing material arizona general election publicity pamphlet i've never seen one of these from another state what's on my ballot of course every state sends these out well let me just fix the camera here so i'm a little more centered every state sends this out to help help you fill out your ballot during election time so it's just, uh, there's propositions and various people running for office and things. And yeah, anyways, that'll be recycled. Okay, first box of discs, Dyson Corporation Diskette, D-E-S-K-E-T-T-E. -E. Nice, let's see here. Okay, so we're just gonna take a quick look through these. I am not gonna break out a computer with an eight inch disc drive to test in this video. Here's a little piece of paper that was in there to back up an entire disc, put into the drive, type F-O-R-M-T parenthesis or number sign, which is, uh, I guess, three or four, Sysgen. So it sounds like CPM with Sysgen. Yeah, I don't know if this was actually on the Model 2 or what, but OBS time requests backed up. So this is like business related stuff. Let's take a look at one of these discs, see if we see any mold or anything. No, that looks really good. Nice and shiny. And is this a double-sided? Yeah, double-sided diskette. Remember I made a video about these diskettes. Um, I'll put a link in the description below to it, but I talk about on the eight inch, uh, a couple things. This is the right protect tab right here. And you need to have this filled in or with a sticker on it where you can write to the disc. This is the opposite of five and a quarter inch disc where if you have a notch cut out, you can write to it. You put a sticker over it to write protect it. This is the invert of that or inverse of that. The sticker on here or no notch at all means you can write to it and cutting a notch in there, it's a little bit of a slot, means uh, it is write protected. The index hole here is in a different position if you have a two-sided disc versus a one-sided disc. So if you take a two-sided disc and you stick it in a single-sided disc drive, it actually doesn't work. The computer can't read it because it can't sense that index hole. Uh, and consequently, double-sided drives almost always support, well, they have two index sensors, which means they can work with either type of disc, but the drive can actually tell them apart. So that disc looks amazing. And we'll just, uh, let's zoom in here and we'll take a quick look at what we see here. OBS time requests, papers, system backup. Oh, these are nice, double-sided again. 
I, I have I have a number of eight inch discs, but there are a lot of single sided discs. I only have a, a few double sided discs. So this is really, really nice. Oh, this is amazing, Andrew. Thank you for that. I have a couple extra sleeves, which is actually good because I think in the rest of my eight inch discs, I have some discs that do not have, um, oh, there's some labels in here. There they are. In the rest of my eight inch discs, I have a couple discs that are missing the sleeve. So I have them like doubled up. But that is awesome. Okay, um, I'm gonna keep organized here. I'm gonna stick these back in here. These will forever be staying in the basement down here, which is nice and climate controlled. Humidity down here is typically 45% or so. And uh, in Fahrenheit, the temperature is generally between, I'd say 68 and maybe 71 in the hottest time in summer. So it stays a nice consistent temperature and humidity down here, which is really good for storing discs and stuff. All right, here is the next box of discs. And we also have an extra sleeve, which is sweet. These are also double-sided. So I don't think these would have been used with the Model 2, Andrew, because the Model 2, as far as I'm aware, um, always had a single-sided disc drive. Now, later TRS-80s had double-sided ones, but the Model 2 was just that Sugar SA-800, which is definitely single-sided. And that means that none of these discs here uh, would actually work in there. Two-sided, double-density, soft sector. This one's called Magic Wand. Uh, is that like a, a game or something? I will definitely, well, need to, I guess, uh, you know, put these into a system, maybe with like some kind of a disc archiver, maybe IMD or something, so I can try to make images of these and then look at like what the contents is of these. It is quite possible that there's some interesting stuff in here. Wow, Opus discs, neat. I remember this brand. They made five and a quarter inch discs as well. I really like how these look. Let's see here. The discs are in immaculate condition. Absolutely immaculate. Notice on the back here, the writing on the back of the envelope is exactly the same as what you'd see on a five and a quarter inch disc. Um, they pretty much just took that and like shrunk it down to fit on a five and a quarter inch discs. So all of these say magic wand. Anyone have any ideas of what magic wand actually could be? <laughs> because I don't know why there'd be so many discs that all say I'm just picking up the box here on the floor. All say magic wand. Okay, next one. Uh, we've got a little bit of a label on here. All discs in this box were formatted to 1.2 megabyte capacity and cisgened to the word processor operating system on 1984, January 3 by D. Tholen. Otherwise, no file. <laughs> Otherwise, no files exist in the directories. And I'm reading this off the screen because this writing is pretty small and uh, without my goggles on, I wouldn't read it. So I'm using the camera magnification to be able to see it. Uh, so that's kind of cool. So word processor. So what kind of word processor would use eight inch double-sided disks like this? That is extra curious. And you know what? Magic wands, it says it on these as well. So was that the name of the word processor? Although only this disc here says magic wand on it and the rest, oh no, a few of these have stuff written on them too. Photometry and radiometry, CPM, deck reformer or reformatter, I guess. There's magic wand again, and it looks like someone um, had written on pencil there. Operating system programs, user programs, ECAS, ECAS data backup, mm, ECAS again, photometry and radiometry backup, system or no, F, uh, 54K MW user disk, that is that 54K magic wand. Um, and that is it. And this disk here is missing the sleeve. So I'll use one of the other ones. We have some extra labels. Uh, is this a double-sided disk? Uh, it does say double-sided right here. Look at the color, how it has this brown color to it. That's interesting, isn't it? It still looks in really good shape, though, so I'm not seeing any kind of issue there. Look at that. Really nice quality disc. These are in amazing condition. Absolutely amazing. I think at this point, with Andrew's generosity and the generosity of some of my other viewers who have sent in discs, I'm pretty much set for 8-inch discs. 
probably for the rest of my life. I don't think I'm ever gonna need uh, to get more because I can use a GoTech drive on any machine that uses an eight inch disk drive, or I can even use a PC 1.2 megabyte, five and a quarter inch disk drive, high density drive in place of one of these eight inch drives. You'd get the exact same performance, disk capacity, everything by using such a drive, because I think I've talked about this before as well. IBM took the eight inch disk drive, which was 360 RPM, 500 kilobits per second data rate, uh, 80 tracks, well, 77 tracks per cylinder, and they just, whoosh, they shrunk it down to a five and a quarter inch. And that is why a 1.2 megabyte drive behaves and looks to a computer exactly the same as an eight inch drive. So any old machine that uses eight inch disks, if it's a soft sector type um, situation, you can just use five and a quarter inch high density disks and the drives, which are far more common and easier to get. So if you're not trying to read these old disks, you could just use a high density drive and um, you would have a much more reliable and cheaper solution because buying eight inch drives right now is very expensive. I was just happy to be looking online because a viewer emailed me and they were asking about uh, what drives were compatible. And I just did a quick eBay search and yeah, the prices on eight inch drives are wow, wow. Anyways. Um, okay. So we got letters. We got the word it says magic wand again. We have an extra sleeve. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Um, I don't know. Do we see anything we recognize here? M80 and L80 this is definitely uh, something for a, what, like Z80 processor. Uh, this is a single-sided disc though right here. This says Control Data Corporation, single-sided, single density. Of course, the single density part is silly because you could you could write FM or MFM encoding onto these discs and it, it both works. You don't need a different disc. Uh, or these are these two are double-sided. I don't know about this one. Oh no, this one here double-sided, obviously. Um, this says something, uh, personal, hmm. maybe there's PII on there. I need to be careful. If I do archive these and I find any kind of personal information, I will of course not share that. I will, uh, purge that and delete it. But, uh, yeah, kind of interesting personal backup and look at the date there, August 31st, 1986. Uh, we have the word, we have more of the word, we have unlabeled, 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 and then a bunch of labels. Let's take a look what we see here. Let me zoom back out. Read before opening. Hmm. Important. All Oasis programs are sold only on the condition that purchase trees that include software license agreement. Read the carefully, blah, blah, blah. The word. Eight inch soft sector did the serial number. So this is a word processor right here. Keep this portion of your registration card. Hmm. Okay. Does anyone recognize this program? Did know what system it ran on? Was this like for any CPM system? I'll be very curious. I'm sure there's people watching who will know this. We have something that's written on hand, uh, written by hand here, on lined paper, and a bunch more labels. Let's see what we see here. Well, it looks like we have some shortcuts here, probably for whatever OS this thing was running. Directory, erase, or ERA, type, RAM, stat. So maybe this is actually for the TRS-80. I don't know. Please comment down below if you recognize this stuff. All right, what's this here? Condensed instruction for the word. So this is that word processor we just saw the registration card for. Looks like it's got a spell checker and look up misspelled word. <laughs> okay, that's it for that one. Video mode summary. Insertion on and off, lots of control things. Uh, yeah, stuff, stuff. More stuff? <laughs> okay. Uh, looks, looks like this has stuff on the back side as well. No, it just looks like it's the same stuff again. And it looks like just more notes. All right. All right, the next box. Let's just quickly go through this. I think it's just going to be more of the same, most likely. Uh, Magic Wand. Looks like a date from 1987. That's a bit surprising again. Someone was using this so late. Lots and lots of magic wand. So really my assumption is magic wand was some kind of word processor. Why wouldn't it be called magic word if it was a word processor though? Unless the name of the word processor computer was magic wand or maybe the entire computer was a magic wand. You know what? Let's take a little interlude and do a quick Google search. Try to find out what magic wand is. I'm going to start with magic wand word processor. Aha, look at that first hit right there. Internet archive. So it looks like someone scanned in the brochure. The magic wand is the most powerful, most flexible, and most reliable, oh, most usable 
word processor available for a CPM computer. It looks like it has capabilities and uh, available on eight inch soft sectored and five and a quarter inch North Star or Micropolis hard sectored or soft sectored disc. So the Micropolis drives were 100 track per inch. So you needed a special, you know, disc format or discs, you know, um, well, whatever the system that made the disc need to be using a drive that's 100 tracks per inch so that it could be read on another system. And then of course the North Star used hard sector five and a quarter inch discs, which meant you needed special discs themselves that had many uh, index holes around there for it to work at all on the North Star. That was a S100 bus type computer, had a wood case, looks really cool. I'd love to get one of those one day. Uh, and then eight inch, I guess for, I, you know, the thing I don't really understand, and it just says eight inch soft sector, like doesn't even specify what system it was for. Oh, well, actually, no, it says right here. Oh, a terminal support. Okay. Oh, as well, oh, sorry. I just saw this as well as Onyx hard disks, but the terminal support. So if you're using a machine like an Altair, for instance, you need to hook a terminal up, right? And to use formatting or ability to like move the cursor around, there has to be support in the software for that terminal. I don't think that was something that generally uh, CPM itself did. It wasn't like later OSs where th th there was sort of a, I don't know, ANSI.sys like there is in DOS. I think basically the software had to support the right control codes and escape sequences and whatnot for the terminals so it would work. So it looks like they they list a bunch. The Lear, Sigler, the Intertech, Microterm, Act 5, Parker Elmer, Sol VDM1. Oh, the Sol, they made a home computer. The Soric, the Tech, the Televideo, the TRS-80 Model 2, hmm. the Vector Graphics plus a variety of other video boards. Look at this, small business applications out of uh, Houston, Texas, right. There is a little bit more info here. It says it, it needs uh, up to 32K, well, 16K minimum, 32K recommended. It runs on serial as well as DMA terminal. DMA, I'm assuming direct memory access means you had a video board in say your Altair S100 system that had memory mapped video memory, direct memory access for DMA. So the software just wrote characters directly into the video buffer and then you would see it on your screen. So I'm assuming that's what this means. Uh, lots of features. Um, I'll put a link to this document in the description. So if you want to see this stuff yourself, um, you can do that or just Google for magic wand, uh, to be honest, uh, word processor, and that'll that'll come right up. Uh, let's see what the price is. Blah, 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 blah. It will retail about $400. And that's in like whatever year this is from. Let's see if we can find a year. It's, it's only unfortunately a two or three page, oh, four page document. There is no year at all here. Wow. Um, well, the fact that TRC Model 2 is listed on here means that, you know, this is from the early 80s, but $400 in the early 80s, it's probably like $1,200 US today, 2023. Not to mention you would have spent all the money on the system here. Wow, that's um, that's pretty pricey, but you know, you had to pay for quality software back in the day, right? Anyways, doesn't really say exactly what systems this runs on, but I assume you just asked uh, like, hey, I have an Altair and I have this type of disc controller card and they would send you the right disc. They must have had the disc prepared for all the different systems. I think that's what I was saying is like, just because you have an eight inch disc drive on an Altair doesn't mean it's the same disc format as say an MSI 8080. It's, it's, yeah, it's MSI 8080, right? <laughs> I think the disk controller itself and like the drivers that are used to access the, you know, the ROM that's on there for the disk access vary considerably from one to another. I mean, very, if you have five and a quarter inch CPM disks from say a K-Pro and you try to read it on another system, it doesn't work unless you have special software that is designed to read the disks from other systems. So anyways, I'm assuming this company just had the disks ready for whatever system you had. You just have to tell them, yeah, like I'm running CPM, on a Z80 and I have, you know, this type of uh, disc controller. That's my assumption, at least. I've never owned any of these types of systems. So if uh, you have an idea of how this worked exactly, like how they got you software that would work, definitely let me know. But wherever these discs came from, clearly the owner was very much into word processing and very much into magic wand. And look, I opened up this box, which I might've already gone through, to be honest. I'm getting confused because Everything just says magic wand. Yeah, I think I went through this box already. I'm assuming these aren't blank and there must be files on these, but who knows, right? Maybe they ended up with a lot of disks. 
and they wanted to have a lot of spares ready. <laughs> I don't know. What we haven't seen necessarily, unless I missed it, is the actual magic wand software itself. Maybe there's a copy of it on every single one of these discs. I don't know. I don't know. Here we go. More Opus discs. Uh, all of them just say magic wand on them. Yep. Let's see here. Look at that. Perfect. Absolute perfect condition. Look at that. It's shiny. It's beautiful. Eight inch discs are very robust, very reliable, but you still have to take care of them and store them in a good environment. And now this is absolutely amazing. This is double sided, double density again. Awesome. So awesome. And really the allure of these discs, you have to think about the time period when these were available, these double-sided discs here with MFM encoding, I think could store uh, an entire megabyte of data. Not quite as much as a high density disc on a PC because that had 80 tracks and these only have 77. So it's a little bit less. And obviously the operating system, well, depending on how the disc format is, you'll lose some space as well. But having an entire megabyte of storage on one floppy disc in like the late, late seventies into the early eighties was Pretty great. If you think about the Apple II disk drives, they were pretty efficient, but only 140K per side. So obviously you could get uh, what, 380 or 280 per disk by flipping it over. And then when uh, the PC came out and you had double-sided drives on there, it started out at like 180K or 160K single-sided, and then went to 180K. And when you had double-sided, you ended up with uh, the, the 360 that we know so well for double-sided five and a quarter inch disks. Anyhow, Andrew, Thank you very much for sending all these. I have, that is it, that we have gone through all the boxes. There are, let's see how many there are. There's one on the bench here. We have two more. We have five boxes, no, uh, six boxes of eight inch discs with most of them being double-sided discs. And that is absolutely fantastic. Let's go back to here. There it is. That is amazing. I just can't even believe it. Plus lots and lots of, uh, these stickers and stuff, these are for write protecting discs. Unfortunately, the problem is this adhesive, oh, it's in pretty good shape, this adhesive. You know what? Maybe adhesive on labels also lasts if discs are climate controlled <laughs> because <laughs> these are really sticky still. Well, not not maybe as sticky as they were when they were new. But the thing, I've, the thing I found when I open up old boxes of discs, the ones that haven't been stored properly, is a lot of times the labels are completely falling off uh, and they're not working so well anymore. You know, I don't even really keep the labels that come in the boxes because they're so old that they just immediately peel off as soon as you try to use them. Anyhow, like I said, Andrew, thank you very much for these discs. I really appreciate it. And um, probably in my off time, I will spend some time and look through these discs, try to see if I can read any of them. And if anything comes up interesting, then that will probably be uh, seen on a video. Alrighty, the next package here, this comes from Kevin in Bellevue, Nebraska. So hi to all my Nebraska viewers. I don't get a lot of packages from Nebraska. Now this one was sent in by Kevin, but actually Kevin visited here in Portland and dropped off a TRS-80 Model 2 for me because he ended up getting this big lot of, of stuff, of TRS-80 stuff, and he got a mint condition Model 2. And if we all remember the Model 2 videos that I did, where the machine was completely wrecked and in terrible shape, but I got it working after a whole bunch of videos. We fixed it up, I cleaned it up and worked really well. Well, he brought me an absolute mint condition Model 2 that looks like it's basically never been used or you know, it was taken out of the box, used once, put back away, in perfect shape. Keyboard, everything, it's just perfect condition. Now, um, he gave that to me. He, he actually was visiting Portland. He put it in the back of his car, brought it all the way out here. He was here with his family, gave that to me. He also gave me a Tier CD Model 1 and uh, a monitor for it. And the Model 1 actually was seen on the main channel. I did a repair on it. I can't remember off the top of my head what was wrong with it. But what he has given me here, um, I know what this is actually because he clued me in. What this is, is I think a power supply for the TRS-80 Model 1, and it's a modern version of the power supply because one of the problems with the power supplies on the Model 1 is they are noisy, buzzy transformer things. And um, this seems to be something for that. So let me unbox this and I will switch camera view. So I'm not sure if this is a kit to build or if this is actually pre-assembled. TRS-80 model, oh, that must be a two, <laughs> right? That's gotta be a two. Uh, this is to fix the keyboard. Ah, yes, okay, yep. 
So um, the Model 2 that he gave me, of course, because it's old, <laughs> like even though it's in mint condition, that doesn't mean the keyboard works. And that's because it's a Keytronic foam and foil. They always fail. So Kevin and his wife, Sarah, over at Tech they make these replacement pads. I've had great luck with these. I fixed the, the original like barn find TRS-80 Model 2 with these pads. Worked flawlessly. I fixed uh, Franklin Ace 1000 with these pads. It worked flawlessly as well. Um, so thank you, Kevin, for sending these. I actually have a bunch more because um, I ordered a bunch because I have a bunch of computers actually kind of built up, stuff I haven't even shown on the channel that need the, the pads replaced. So I'm gonna do that keyboard. I'm pointing over to the Model 2, which is sitting kind of off to my left there. I'm gonna fix that keyboard. I will not make a video of it though, because I've already done that. So I will link to that in the description below. So if you wanna watch me do the foam and foil replacement on a Model 2 keyboard, um, <laughs> the video is there. Didn't do very well if I recall when I made that video, um, but because it's probably not that <laughs> interesting. But if you're doing any Keytron a keyboard, it's the same exact procedure exactly the same. These pads are for all Keytronics. Plus, I think there's some other keyboards that might use these as well. Okay, so what we have here is a mains cord. Here's obviously, this is a kit. So 120 volt mains cord. Okay, so there's two cords here. Now, these DIN cords are what connect the power supply for the Model 1 to both the computer and the expansion interface. With the original power supply, it only supplies power to the main computer. And for the expansion interface, which is that module that has more RAM and disk drive controller and ports and stuff into it has its own power supply which is identical to the one for the computer there's just two and what people do or what is it was designed to do is there's space inside the expansion interface to hold both of those power bricks but then there's a bunch of wires and like two mains power cords that come out it's all ridiculous so i think what this is is a new replacement power supply i think that supplies power to both the computer and the expansion interface so that's pretty nice. Um, now, is this a kit? Ooh, look at this. Okay. Um, wow. Looks like we have a fuse here. Okay. Wow, Kevin, really, really nice here. Uh, let's, uh, oh, we got a little bit of a breakage on here. It's not the end of the world, though, because I actually have replacements of these. This is a pretty standard part, so I can just desolder it, and I'll put a new one on. There is a fuse here that goes in the fuse holder. Anyhow, let's look at this. 110 volts, TRS-80 Model 1 power supply, revision 1.2, original circuit de design by Dean Baer. So we have like a bridge rectifier here. We have a capacitor. And I guess I didn't fully realize that there is a bridge rectifier and a capacitor in the original power supplies because looking at the pinout here for these two connectors is what goes to the computer. There's a DC positive ground and then two AC lines. So I guess both AC and DC goes. Now, my assumption is that because this is loose, this is designed, we'll zoom out a little bit, this is designed to go inside the expansion interface. I think it probably mounts in there you would run the power cord out to the wall um, with this power cord that's supplied here. Of course, this connector would need to be replaced. And then uh, you just connect these cords. Now, the short one is gonna be for the expansion interface itself. It just needs to come out of the little compartment that holds the original power supplies. And then you just plug this in. And then this longer one here is for the computer itself because the computer itself needs to be very close to the expansion interface because there's a very short ribbon cable that connects the two together for the data and the address lines and stuff like that. But there's enough length here to uh, you know give you a little bit of room to move it around and stuff like that. And yeah, that's pretty awesome. And why this is really cool is because sometimes I wanna use my Tier City Model 1 outside of the expansion interface. And sometimes I want, or outside, I wanna use it away from the expansion interface, which means if I have the power supplies like screwed into the expansion interface inside, it's kind of a pain. But what I can do is I can just leave this in my expansion interface, I have one, have these wires just hanging out. And when I wanna use it, I could just plug it in, but I could put the expansion interface away with these inside. And then I have the external power supplies uh, that are standalone. And those are perfect because I can plug that then into the Model 1 if I wanna use it away from the computer. And incidentally, I have two Model 1s because that's Kevin gave me an extra one. And therefore now I have two of those power supplies to use with it, which is just great. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to desolder and fix this broken connector here. Oh, I need to find a spare, I guess. Put a new one on there 
and then we'll give this thing a quick test. Okay, so unfortunately I was e easily able to get this off the board, no problem there, but I looked around for several minutes for my bag filled with these. I know I have a bag full of them and I didn't immediately find it. <laughs> kind of the problem sometimes down here in the basement. I kind of misplaced, it's not like I misplaced it, it's just I have this big tote that's filled with components like this that I have yet to kind of put away into my little, I don't know, little drawer unit things, little organization things. I just haven't spent a lot of time sorting that stuff and going through all the things that I have and putting them into logical places so I can find them. They're all in that tote, but unfortunately that tote is, well, because I'm out of space down here really at this at the moment, it is not easily accessible. So that means that this is gonna have to wait until I uh, find that part, but it'll be no problem be able to get that on. And I'm sure this works because there's really not a lot going on. And in case you're wondering, these blue things here are just transformers. The fins on here are a little bit of a heat sink thing going on. Uh, this is just what they are available and look like these days. Looks like it's a nine volt, 12.5 VA transformer. I'm assuming there's two windings at center tapped. I think that's what that means. There's probably people who know far more about this stuff than me. I'm gonna ask Kevin, who's the one who sent this in, and I'm gonna ask him if there's a link for this. I'll put it down below. So if you need one of these things for your tr CD Model 1 expansion interface, uh, you can get one as well. But I'm assuming this is something you could probably buy yourself, I'm thinking, I'm not too sure. So thank you very much, Kevin, for sending in this power supply for the expansion interface and the FOMO foil key, key pads or pads for the keyboard. I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, it's funny that it didn't survive shipping really, even though you had it really well packed. There was all that packing material around it, but yeah, we have a little bit of shrapnel here, things that didn't survive, but no, but no worries. This thing will still absolutely work 100% for sure. Alrighty, the next package here comes from, can't quite make it out, but it's from someone in Seattle, Washington. So just a few hours drive up Interstate 5 from Portland. So hi to all my Seattle and or Washington viewers. Washington State literally being 10 minutes north of me. You can just drive over the Columbia River and then you were there in Washington State. So we're at the very bottom of Washington State in Oregon, of course. And uh, Seattle is up near the top of the state. It's not all the way at the top because you can keep going until you hit Canada, but it's a lot of the way there. Okay, so we got, well, well, well. <laughs> I just recorded a whole segment and I, I'm a little miffed. I found that OBS just stopped recording for its, for no reason, to be honest. Although now I think about it, I had the mouse sitting on the bench and it was, the mouse pointer was over the start button, start recording. And maybe I bumped the mouse <laughs> and that stopped recording. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to review the footage, I guess, and uh, let's see what happened. All right, well, what we have in the box, what I just unboxed is a Wii PC. And what the Wii PC is, well, here it is right here. I already unwrapped it. This is a little tiny DOS gaming PC. And you can see how small this thing is, and it's a solid metal case. I'm not gonna do a review of this or, or test this right now. Uh, the guys from Seattle sent this in for me. They made this. This is now made in the U.S. by uh, some guys up in Seattle. And they sent this to me for checking out, for review. I'm not going to keep this. I'll send it back to them. Um, it's pretty cool. VGA, 486 processor in here. Ethernet, USB, micro USB power, game port, actual uh, micro SD for storage, PS2 input, and the sound output is a Cirrus Logic chip, which I think has DOS compatibility. It's not full Sound Blaster, but it's like Sound Blaster-ish. Windows 95, Windows 98, it has DOS support. And it's a 486 processor, but it's a 486, some modern 486, that can, I think, go from 25 megahertz all the way up to 800 megahertz. So it's equivalent of like Pentium 2 performance. The video in here, the video processor in here does not have 3D capability, so it's software rendering only, but like a Pentium 233, it's pretty good for doing software rendering, at least at 320 by 240. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Now, this letter here talks about it. And as I said, I'm not gonna be doing um, a, a review of this right now. And that's why this is sent in. I just wanted to check this out myself. 
but it looks like um, these are gonna go up when they're done. These are hand assembled, or hand assembled each one of them, and they will go up on eBay once they're available, and the starting bid is $500. And I think when these do go up on sale, because these originally came from a person in the UK who was making these, when these are in the US and they go up for sale, or the ones that are there, they're not common, there aren't a lot of them out there, they go for a pretty hefty penny. In fact, uh, it says here up to $800 on eBay. So $500 seems steep, but it's a good starting price. And what's cool about this thing is it's not a bunch of unreliable old equipment. You might've seen a recent video on the channel. I don't remember if it was a second channel. I think it was a second channel where a 36SX motherboard, a rare one with VLB slots got killed when the power supply I was working with decided to short out and melt down and it destroyed the motherboard in the process. And that was that. Incidentally, if you watch that video, I tried a bunch of troubleshooting to try to get that computer alive again, and I could not find any faults. I did a whole ton of troubleshooting. I didn't do it on camera because I actually didn't think I would ever get anywhere with it, and sure enough, I didn't. But I was testing that the, um, you know, the signals looked okay. The, the ROM BIOS was working. In fact, oh, this is pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Right here is the processor from that board. It was the 46 SLC. I desoldered it to put onto another machine. But anyhow, I digress. The reason why things like this are pretty cool is if you don't have space for a big bulky computer and you want to run DOS games on actual hardware and not emulation, this is a great way to do it. And you're not running with a bunch of old, unreliable hardware that is going to crap out and <laughs> damage things. So it's kind of a great turnkey solution for that. Um, this has the computer right here. We had a little package here. It looks like there's a little stand maybe. Oh no, Dream Blaster S2. Right, this has a Dream Blaster inside as well. So that's for general MIDI music. So you're not just stuck with just the FM sound, FM-ish sound and the uh, Sound Blaster-ish compatibility. You got some really good FM or MIDI sound uh, with a Dream Blaster. So if you're playing something like Duke 3D, it's gonna sound amazing or a lot of those other DOS games. Um, yeah, I don't know what this thing is or how this works. I'm not sure the bag is actually, maybe the Dream Blaster is inside. Anyways, there's an SD card here. So um, maybe that's, uh, maybe there's an SD card in here. Yes, uh, no, there's just a slot. So I guess uh, that's a micro SD ca uh, card in a regular adapter. Anyhow, there's that, there's a power supply here. It's just micro USB, so really easy to power. You could use a power bank and you know, all that stuff. Um, looks like uh, in the letter here, we have disassembly instructions. We have uh, links to some previous reviews, like one on the Dream Blaster itself, and then on the original build of the Wii PC from uh, the Rastery, or Rasteri, he's the person who came up with it in the first place. And then LGR did a review of the Wii PC. I think the LGR review, which is a few years old, if I recall, is of the one that came from the UK, not this one here, which is uh, the made in the USA or made in the Pacific Northwest up in Seattle. So thanks guys for saying this in. I definitely have it. It's not lost or anything like that. And I will uh, do a review of it at some point in the future. Can't make any promises because I'm kind of behind on everything. Hence the fact I'm opening up mail call packages that I got last year and we're almost at the end of March. It's a bit of a problem. Anyways, okay, on to the next thing. I will do one more item and then I'll call it for this video. All right, the next package here is from Daryl in, looks like Saddle River, New Jersey. Are you Saddle River, New Jersey? Is that University of Saddle River? Anyhow, um, hi to all my New Jersey viewers. I will be at VCF East in April, which is coming up very soon, and that is in New Jersey. So I'll be there. So if you're in New Jersey yourself, you can come to the show and uh, say hello. All right, so this is a lot like the Wii PC where I'll show it, but I'm not gonna actually show it working because that will be for another video as well. And uh, this is kind of funny in a way because this video has had a bunch of things that I couldn't show anything. So unlike my normal videos, mail call videos, where at least I turn stuff on, there's nothing to turn on here. <laughs> so uh, let me switch cameras and you will understand what I'm talking about. So what we have here is an Evo 64. Now these made the rounds. These were on all sorts of uh, YouTube channels. I think uh, I think David Murray, a big guy, he reviewed one of these. Uh, Jan Bita reviewed one of these. I think these have been reviewed by several people. I have not reviewed it yet. Oh yeah, Parafractic on Retro Recipes as well. 
So the Evo 64, what this is, is a modern 64 motherboard. Let's take a look at it a little closer. Zoom out a little bit. Let's cut the tape open here. Now, like the other things on this video, I've had this since uh, I think December or maybe even November. And I think the creators of this were hoping to get some attention to it. But I suppose a video from me a little bit later than all the others, maybe will bring some renewed attention if people don't watch those other channels. Anyhow, like I was saying, this is a modern 64 motherboard and there it is. Let's just fold this plastic over. I have to say, looks really cool. Modern 64 replacement. So a really cool looking black PCB, really nice gold plating on like all the contacts on the, where the RF shield would go, like as if I'm gonna put an RF shield on this thing? Yeah, no. Looks like the through hole stuff was all hand soldered on here. Uh, could use a little bit of cleanup, I have to say. Uh, let's see, if I zoom up here, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. There's some flux residue there. A little bit of scrubbing with some flux remover would have made this thing look just a little bit nicer, a little cleaner. So a couple things about this, and I mean, I won't talk too much about it because um, like I said, I'm gonna make a, full, a, a bigger video about it. <laughs> what is normally the RF modulator right here, let's uh, zoom in on this. It's got, it's got a vacuum tube here. It um, kind of looks like a vacuum fluorescent display, but I think it's actually a vacuum tube. And this is used in the audio amplification circuit for the SID. It's kind of funny to me that that's on here. Uh, I think it's a, an option for this board. You don't have to get it with this. This is optional. It's pretty expensive. Maybe this uh, letter here will talk about the pricing. But the SID itself is a very, very noisy chip. And any kind of like smoothing you're going to hope to get from the vacuum tube on here, um, well, you know, maybe you can hear it. I haven't tested this. Obviously, I just unboxed this, unboxed it. I doubt I'll be able to hear anything. <laughs> I've never, I've never listened to a vacuum tube stereo, which I've heard before and thought, ooh, that sounds great. I was more just like, oh, those speakers sound really good that you have hooked up that are, you know, worth $10,000. Um, anyhow, yeah, so this is kind of interesting. Look at these large caps here, surface mount. I think this here has got to be a boost converter here, probably to generate some high voltages that the caps need. Interesting how um, there's some cables here that they go to this. Other characteristics about this board, dual SID support. So SID 1 and SID 2, so you can have stereo SID. You got some uh, dip switches here. There's a GAL, or I guess it's called a QAPLA, quad PLA or something, but look at the little surface mount thing. So it's a modern replacement that's not going to break. You do need original chips for this though. So obviously this right here is the CPU. Over here, you got the two CIA 6526s. So you need the original parts. Notice the RAM though, does not use normal DRAM, which is understandable because I don't think, you know, that any of that DRAM is even being made anymore, but I'm hoping that this is actual regular DRAM here and not like SRAM. And the reason why I say that is I know there's been a bunch of SRAM mods for 64s, but I don't think it necessarily works 100% of the time. Like it works, generally works, but sometimes the, the thresholds and the timing on those chips, it's just not, not exactly the same and you might end up with issues. No idea the compatibility level on this. Looks like there's like an unpopulated uh, spot right here. Uh, all the TTL logic chips that are normally on here, like this stuff here is surface mount, but we do have one regular chip here, which, oh, yep. Yeah, 2114 SRAM. So you can't get away with that. There's no modern equivalent with like surface mount of that chip. And I don't know if you could use a newer 8-bit SRAM, like say one off of 46 in place of this. It's possible, but I'm not positive about that. This is used by the VIC-2 for the color RAM. So the VIC-2 needs to talk directly to that. So maybe they found that if you didn't use the original 214, it wouldn't work well. Anyhow, you also need, of course, an original VIC-2 or, or one of the modern replacements that exist. And then this is the timing circuitry here. And I'm assuming, well, I don't know if it's actually the timing. Uh, no, clear video. Okay, so this has got like a, oh, what's it called? The thing that removes the jail bars that I don't think work very well. <laughs> I can't remember what those things are even called, but normally uh, it goes under the VIC chip and you have these pots here and you tweak the settings and you try to get rid of the jail bars. But personally, I think they don't work well because 
if you have a blue screen, like a blue background, and you get rid of the jail bars, which are the vertical lines that you see from a VIC-2, and this is coming because there's interference because the VIC-2 has a bunch of, um, does all the timing refresh for the RAM. So because of that, there's just interference on the picture. Some chips are worse than others. When you dial out the, the lines in say the blue background, when you bring up a gray background, there'll then be lines again. So I just don't think those things work that well, but you know, maybe this one will work better because it's this very interesting zoom up here. Well, that was the wrong way. Look at all this like surface mount version of it. That's pretty cool. Um, and this right here is the clock generator. So it's a modern clock generator. Normally that's handled by a bunch of, you know, chips and stuff. I notice there's two crystals on here. That means that this is surely going to work with both PAL and NTSC VIC-2s. As is normal with the 64 though, those chips are not interchangeable. I mean, you could plug them into the same socket, but you need a different crystal oscillator. So you cannot give a PAL clock signal to an NTSC VIC-2 and get a working computer or working picture. You need to use a PAL VIC-2 with a PAL setting on the clock circuitry or NTSC and NTSC. So just in case you're wondering if you could get both PAL and NTSC out of one VIC-2, that is not the case. There is also, well, look at these caps here instead of the normal three <laughs> regular caps. There are these giant caps. We have the bridge rectifier here. There's a fuse as is normal. There's the choke there, which is as is normal. We have the switch here, the power switch, which seems uh, pretty standard. And then we have some voltage regulation down here, which you would have on a normal long board. This is a long board replica. It's not a short board replica, which means looks like, oh, you can use both types of VIC-2 chips though. The ones designed for the, sh the long boards, which are 6,000 series, and the ones designed for the, sh the short boards, which are the 8,000 series. They run at a different volts voltage. You do not want to plug the wrong one into the wrong motherboard. You will potentially damage your chip. The SIDS, the same thing. This can work with a, both the 8,000 series and the 6,000 series. So it's pretty flexible that way. And it looks really sweet. And if you want to have a 64 that basically, uh, you know, can do everything, you know, where you can have double SIDs and PAL or NTSC compatibility, depending on which things you have and all the mods and the stuff. And, <laughs> and this is the ROM chip here, and it probably has a bunch of different kernels in there. Uh, looks like they combine all the ROMs in there. Yep. So um, it's probably selectable or whatever, and you can probably flash a new one. And let's just take a quick look at the letter here, see if there's anything of interest. So, yep, there it is. We've included the new Tube 64 audio preamp module as well as a pre programmed QA PLA and multi ROMs, which should make your setup easy as adding some chips, key case, and blah, blah, blah. And you do need a 30 watt or better power supply for this module here. Now, I do have that because the power supply I use is like a four amp, five volt power supply. There is a QR code. Let's uh, zoom in on this. Uh, so there's the QR code. Go ahead and scan your screen with your phone if you're watching on a TV or a computer. If you want to check this out yourself, as I said, I will make a follow-up video where I actually populate this thing and we kind of run it through its paces. And I want to see how well this uh, clear video jail bar fix thing actually works. Maybe it's better because the, the board layout is totally different. We'll do some compatibility testing on this thing. And that's what I kind of really want to know. And then we'll, you know, I have an, a USB audio DAC here. We can do some direct captures. You can listen to tube audio on YouTube. <laughs> YouTube ruins audio quality. So like, <laughs> I don't think that's gonna help much. If you're interested in this Evo 64, I'll put a link down below in the description below. And um, I'll put a link to the other reviews of this thing too, if you wanna watch those, if you haven't already. I mean, my review is probably gonna be a little superfluous. I'll try to figure out different things to do with it that hasn't been done before. <laughs> I'm not sure there is anything, but uh, like I said, I'll definitely make another video where at least I populate this thing and test it out. So yeah, thanks guys for sending this in. And um, there it is, the Evo 64 with the new Tube 64 audio preamp. And I guess that is gonna be that for this mail call video. What's funny is I have the phone set up there. As you can see, it's plugged in and everything and um, I can switch to it. It is working. There it is. There's the, the 64 there. Let's switch back. Uh, so I had it set up there in case I needed to have something on the bench I wanted to shoot from that direction. 
but that didn't come up. None of the things we had here on this mail call episode actually needed that to work, but it's kind of cool. The phone uh, survived. It didn't run out of battery sitting there. I guess it's pulling from the battery pack. And yes, I have a, an iPhone there right now. I was using an Android phone last time. And I got to say, the one thing about NDI, which is this network digital interface thing from New Tech I'm using, which allows me to stream from phones over Wi-Fi right to OBS, the one thing is there's no way to control the white balance on that program. It's auto white balance. And what really sucks, and let's move this a little bit, what really sucks about the iPhone, I'm probably not going to use it anymore for this purpose, is if we switch to it, the color balance, oh, it's also really laggy for some reason, the color balance on the iPhone, and I'm switching back to the camera, the color balance is terrible. The lights in the basement are like 4,000 Kelvin, and for whatever reason, the iPhone camera, even the just the regular photo, like you take photos down here, the pictures come out all weird and pink and sometimes really blue, like a really, really bluish hue to them. They, it just does not work properly. Meanwhile, my Pixel 6 has no problems down here. It works perfectly. Auto white balance results in a picture that, well, looks like this camera, which is on auto white balance, by the way. This is a Elgato face cam. It doesn't have any problems. The uh, regular cameras up, like the one I shoot here, is set to manual white balance. I've set those up, you know, once before because all the lighting down here is LEDs and it doesn't change the white balance. But yeah, the auto white balance here works. Auto white balance on the iPhone, that's a 13 Pro Max or whatever. Terrible. <laughs> I have rambled a lot in this video. So I wanted to say thank you very much to everyone who sent stuff in. The uh, new 64 here, the Wii PC, that's a two future videos I'll have to have. There are the eight inch floppy disks here that Andrew sent in. Thank you very much for those. And then we have the power supply, which is down there in the box for from Kevin. That's for my Tier City Model 1 and the expansion interface. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for the keyboard pads as well. So I can get the keyboard fixed on the Model 2. <laughs> so, so if you like this video, thumbs up. If you know, do all the YouTube stuff, uh, subscribe, all that stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling off the screen. They really make this possible. Revenue is kind of sucking on YouTube lately, even though my views are doing pretty pretty nicely. Um, revenue just is pretty flat, but my patrons, they, they go above and beyond and it, it really means a lot to me. So thank you very much, but thank you to my viewers who send in these awesome donations. Okay, I think I'm losing my voice. I've talked, talked, and talked some more. <laughs> so thank you very much for watch, watching. Stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.